All right, good morning, church. So I hope you have a Bible with you. Go ahead and open it up to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Picking up right where we left off last week, I'm going to read right here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So if you'd follow along in your copy of God's Word, I'll read this aloud to us. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. So J.I. Packer is one of the most respected theologians of our time. He's now with the Lord. Uh, In 1984, he wrote a book called Keep in Step with the Spirit. And in that book, he was interacting with the teaching of the charismatic movement, Pentecostal charismatic movement, kind of higher life teaching. He uses a number of different phrases to, to capture charismatic movement teaching. And what was surprising wasn't the critiques that he offered. There were, there were some important and needed critiques of the charismatic movement that he levied in that book. What was surprising to me, though, as someone who was raised in the charismatic movement, so my, my parents were both, my dad planted a church, and it was a charismatic Pentecostal-type church. So what surprised me is one who was raised in that movement is that while he issued a number of needed correctives, Packer displayed tremendous grace and generosity in his evaluation of the overall movement of charismatic people. So he he says in the book that he saw charismatics in general, uh, their experience, their emphasis on experiencing God, their openness and expectation to the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And he said those things were needed correctives. They needed to be recovered uh, in the history of the church because they had been lost. There was a stagnant kind of faith, to be sure, theological orthodoxy in many places, but an absence of the vibrancy and power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And so he said, I see this as largely a net gain for the body of Christ. The global body of Christ was blessed when Pentecostals recovered an emphasis on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And again, I I agreed with all of his correctives that he would issue in the course of the book, but in a strange way, I'm reading through this book that's largely corrective of charismatic theology, and again, in a strange way, I finished the book, I read it years ago, uh, with a renewed sense of appreciation for my parents, a renewed sense of appreciation for uh, my mom and dad, because one of the biggest things that my mom and dad modeled for us in our home and taught us by example was to hunger for the presence of God, to to be thirsty for the Lord, to, to ask for the Lord to come and move in your life and to expect that the Holy Spirit, when you ask him, might just walk up and do just that. He might just walk up as you're asking for him to come and he might walk into the room and start changing your life and start moving in wonderful ways. We saw that model, we heard that encouraged from our parents. When it, when it came to going deep in the faith, this statement from J.I. Packer in the book, it sounded so much like things that my dad said. Here's a quote. A simple Bible reader and sermon hearer who is full of the Holy Spirit will develop a far deeper acquaintance with his God and Savior than a more learned scholar who is content with being theologically correct. Uh, What a needed word that is. 
or another, perhaps one of the great preachers of the 20th century in reform circles is recognized as D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Here's one of the things that D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said about his ministry. I spend half my time telling people to study doctrine, the other half telling them doctrine is not enough. Read that again. I spend half my time telling people to study doctrine, the other half telling them doctrine is not enough. I wonder which one you need more of those two statements. Do you need the great doctor, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, to come up and tell you, hey, study doctrine. Let me just pause. That needs to maybe land on some of you. That's, it's important. It strengthens us. It makes us stable in the faith. It gives us roots. So just pause. Study doctrine. Is that what you needed to hear most in your Christian life right now? Or do you need to hear most in your Christian life right now? Doctrine is not enough. By all means, don't stop <laughs> studying doctrine. But doctrine is insufficient. So Acts chapter 2 is a transition point in redemptive history. So we could consider it as this unrepeatable transitional moment in history as the new covenant is launching and the birth of a new covenant people takes place through when the Holy Spirit falls on the church. We could look at it primarily from that angle and I think there would be tremendous benefit and profit from that kind of study. But my, my prayer and the angle I'm coming at this morning is that we would come away from this passage convinced that the Holy Spirit is awesome and that we would want him on the move in our lives. And we would be hungry for him to come in power and to make his presence known in our daily experience and in our lives and in our workplace and in our schools and that he would come breathe fresh life into believers around this room, that he would convict people of sin and draw in a harvest from our city, that Holy Spirit just do that thing that he's done before and do it again in our day. You hungry for that? I hope you are. So three truths about the Holy Spirit so that we can engage him in our everyday lives. Number one, the Holy Spirit is sovereign. (laughs) Holy Spirit is sovereign. You see there in verse one. So when the day of Pentecost arrived. So just a quick word about Pentecost, all right? It was... It was one of three annual Old Testament festivals that took place every year in Jerusalem. And so the people from everywhere, Israelites who had been flung in the diaspora, they had been exiled in different places, and then they just planted there, and their families stayed there all around the world. Well, three times a year, you didn't stay where you, you lived. You, you came back home. You came back to Jerusalem, the city of your, uh, of your people. And so you'd make this pilgrimage from all over the world for these feasts. You see there in verse 5? There were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. So they've come from every nation under heaven, and they're staying in Jerusalem, and they're staying in Jerusalem because there's a feast, there's a festival, and we all come to Jerusalem. Jerusalem would multiply to hundreds of thousands of people would be spilling out of every place in that city. So realize what's beginning to brew here is a, it's a mono-ethnic but a multicultural gathering. And I say monoethnic, multicultural uh, because it's almost all Jews, ethnicity wise, but they're from all over the world and they've been there for centuries, many of them. So different cultures, different cities, different upbringings, different practices, spoke different languages, right? So they're bringing all that multiculturalism into this city. And all this, don't miss it, is part of God's providential plan because Jerusalem on today, is about to become ground zero for a multicultural and multi-ethnic global family of God. That's what gets launched on this particular day, on the day of Pentecost. So that's coming, but this much is clear if you're taking notes. This outpouring of the Spirit happens at God's initiative. It happens at God's initiative. You see there in verse one, they were all together in one place, Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven. So, that word suddenly in scripture often captures something of the, uh, 
the intrusive grace of God, the, the surprising intervention of God in history. I'll give you a couple of examples. Luke 2, 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory be to God in the highest and so on and so forth, right? That was a, this is a distinct moment. Something big is happening. Suddenly you need to hear about it. Here's another one, Acts 9, verse three. Now as he went, this is Saul of Tarsus before he becomes the apostle Paul. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and there it is again, suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And that suddenly is, uh, becomes a, a legendary event in the life of Saul of Tarsus who would then become the apostle Paul and would stop persecuting the church and begin proclaiming the very gospel that he had tried to stop. So in other words, sometimes God breaks onto the scene without asking for permission. He's not sort of gently knocking on the door. He blasts the thing off the hinges and says, I'm moving in now. It, it's enough. Everything changes and it starts now, right? I love when God gets pushy. And it happens all over the Bible where he's like, he just snatches his people out of the jaws of their idols and their false gods and he just says, enough. I'm saving you now. <laughs> you haven't given me reason to do this. Matter of fact, the prophets would frequently say that. God would say, you haven't given me reason to do it, so I'm gonna do it for my own name's sake. I'm gonna save you because I decided to and because it brings glory to my name. Here, here's the awesome thing about the sovereignty of God. When God wants to revive his people, he revives them. <laughs> when he wants to revive his people, he revives them. Uh, in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, God's people were, uh, were rebellious, rebellious. They were constantly resisting. They were entrenched in resistance against God. And, and God says, has one of those that's enough kind of moments. Here's what he says in Ezekiel 36. I'm gonna start doing things. Here's what I'm gonna do. I will take you from the nations and gather you from, notice the language, all the countries. That's the same language that's being used here in Acts. And will bring you into your own land. I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. These are the holy I wills of a sovereign God. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Guess where that prophecy finds its fulfillment? Pentecost. That, that's the street date of Ezekiel 30. All those I wills land on this glorious day, the day of Pentecost. You, you think about the significance of that feast, the feast of Pentecost. So it was a feast known as a feast of harvest. It was a feast of the ingathering of the harvest. And how perfect is that? Because here's God and here's God's people coming from all over the world and they're coming for a feast of harvest and God is gonna swing the sickle and harvest them from the fields of the nations. It's gonna move from 120 believers to 3,000 believers. That's a massive harvest. That's a huge harvest. And today, God is Lord of the harvest. Pentecost collides with centuries of baked in unbelief and apathy. So underneath this narrative of events in the book of Acts, there are lots of hints, again, already talked about this for a brief moment, there are lots of hints that Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel is in the background as the story is being told in this way with this kind of language. So in Ezekiel, what happens, there's a dramatic moment in the book of Ezekiel where the Holy Spirit departs from the temple, picks up and leaves, and you watch taillights go as the Holy Spirit departs from the temple. And he departs from the temple and he leaves Jerusalem. And here on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, wait, where? In Jerusalem. Spirit's coming back to the city. And, and the Holy Spirit comes down upon the temple. The Spirit of God returns to the temple, but with a twist. What's the twist? Well, the new temple won't be a building. It will be believers. The Holy Spirit's coming back to the temple, but it's a temple with a twist. God's presence will not dwell in temples made by human hands. In the new covenant, God's Spirit comes to reside within the believer's life. Life. 
That's why Jesus said to the woman from Samaria, and she said, which mountain is the holy mountain? Which mountain has the best Wi-Fi access to the presence of God? And he says, listen, give me a minute and mountains won't matter because you will worship him in spirit and in truth. You will carry the flame with you wherever you go. The spirit will be in you and with you. It's awesome. Pentecost is awesome. Holy Spirit is sovereign. Second truth, the Holy Spirit manifests the presence of God. So there are many ways in which God appears to people in the Old Testament, and the technical word for this is a theophany. You've heard of somebody having an epiphany? Well, a theophany is, has the word theo in it, theo, God. It's, it's an appearance of God. It's, it's the invisible God making himself visible in some way or another. So Acts 2 is a theophany, a visible manifestation of the invisible God. Happens throughout the Old Testament where God appears to someone as the angel of the Lord or appears to someone in a human figure, appears to someone as a mighty warrior, appears to someone as a chariot with wheels and eyes. All these different phenomenal events, things that you can see, but God is coming in this moment. So two of the most common theophanies in Scripture are right here in Acts 2, wind and fire. In the Old Testament, God frequently demonstrates his presence, flexes through wind and fire. So just look at those one at a time. So wind. In both the Hebrew language of the Old Testament and the Greek language of the New Testament, the word for spirit is the same word for wind. It's the same word for breath. So throughout scripture, there are times where the word wind occurs or the word breath occurs, but it is not signaling just an ordinary gust of wind outside. It's signaling God just came. God just blew in. He blew in with the wind. This is not no ordinary wind. God is here among us. So for example, the parting of the Red Sea, that was no ordinary wind. It was, it was a massive wind event there in the Old Testament that made the water stand up and move out of the way and the people of God crossed over on dry ground. It was a wind event. The east wind, the Old Testament says, gathered up the waters so that they walked through on dry ground. It was, was it wind or was it God? And the answer is yes. God was in the wind. It was a theophany. It was a visible manifestation of the invisible God. If you're familiar with the book of Ezekiel, again, One of the most famous scenes in the entire book of Ezekiel is this vision that God gives to the prophet himself, the prophet Ezekiel, and it's a vision of a valley of what? Dry bones. It's a valley of dry bones. In other words, in this vision, the impression that's left on Ezekiel as he looks out and sees this valley of dry bones is some army was slaughtered in this valley, and it's been a long, long time. These are not corpses. There's no flesh. These are just bones that have been bleached by the sun for centuries and centuries. This is a long dead army that's been slaughtered somewhere long ago. And in this vision, God tells Ezekiel to do something strange. He says, here's what I want you to do. Open your mouth and preach over the dead bones in the valley. And he says, prophesy to the four winds. And Ezekiel opens his mouth and starts preaching, following the Lord's direction. And what starts happening? The wind comes into the valley, and the bones start rattling. (laughs) And the bones start finding each other, right? And the foot bone connected to the knee bone. We have a song that sings about this, right? And here come the bones, and they're forming bodies and skeletons, and now they're standing up, and now the Holy Spirit puts flesh on them, and they're this living, breathing, vibrant army. And God says, let me tell you what this vision is all about. A day is coming, he says in Ezekiel 37, verse 14, where I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. It was about God breathing life into a long dead people, an apathetic people who had lost their way. Here in Acts 2, the sound of rushing wind in the upper room, this would not have been lost on people steeped in their Old Testament. This bodes very well. This wind that's coming, this bodes well for our future. The people of God by this time had a centuries running habit of resisting the power of God until today. (laughs) Because today, the wind blows through the valley and the bones start rattling. 
And he says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. You will come alive. Everything changes. Street date for the new covenant starts right here, right now. Friends, Pentecost fulfills the promise that God would reclaim the wonder and witness of his people. That's what's happening. Bleached, dried bones in the valley are gonna come together and form a missional army empowered by the spirit. Not only the sound of wind, so that's part of the theophany, right? The visual presence of something like fire. You see there in verse three? They, so they heard something, but then verse three, they saw something. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and, interesting, rested on each one of them. And again, fire is another of the most common theophanies in the entire Old Testament. When God speaks to Moses, he speaks to Moses through a what? Burning bush, right? So God is present in the fire, visible manifestation of the invisible God. When, uh, when Solomon completed the construction of the temple, he prays and right after he says amen, fire comes from heaven and consumes the sacrifices. In other words, God has just come from heaven and he's filling the temple. He's living in, he's coming and residing in the temple. But notice here where the fire goes. It doesn't go into the building in Jerusalem. The fire goes on every individual believer. There's a tongue of fire above every single one of these 120 disciples representing God's presence and it divides and rests on each one of them. So what's the point? Each one of them is becoming a temple for God's dwelling. This is a new day now. They're discovering that in the new covenant, God's presence isn't just a corporate experience but an individual indwelling. It's not just a corporate experience, it's an individual indwelling. You think about another classic story in the Old Testament where the people have been rescued from bondage and slavery in Egypt and then they're walking through the wilderness and they're struggling to survive and they're walking out of the darkness and they're afraid and what leads them through the darkness of the wilderness? A column of fire. It's a beautiful picture of the way God leads his people even through darkness. And here, though, in Acts 2, the fire rests on every individual. God's spirit is given to every disciple, and God's spirit teaches and guides every true disciple. Let me ask you this in your own personal life. Have you ever sensed the Lord turning you? I remember when our kids were young, and if they were, you know, they're looking all every which way, you're at a theme park or whatever, so everybody needs to be moving in the same direction. One of the easiest ways to do that is just to reach down and take their head and just turn it this way, right? They're, they're looking off that way, and you just reach down just gently, and you turn their head this way, and they just, you know, just follow where you're, has that ever happened to you? It's a gift from God through his Holy Spirit that he just kind of reaches down and just turns your head. Has that ever happened in your life where God redirects your life towards something or redirects your life, notably, away from something, only for you to discover later, that was God. God was directing me away from that. That was destructive, and I didn't even know it, but he just gently turned my head and moved me in another direction. Friends, that's downstream of the gift of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. He was leading you, leading you through darkness like he led Israel through darkness with a column of fire. This great hymn that was written in 1862, he leadeth me. Sometimes amid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by waters still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. This is a beautiful experience for the life of every believer. The Christian life, friend, is more than a series of doctrinal formulations. It is a daily engagement with God through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Daily engagement, daily guidance, daily wisdom, daily conviction, daily encouragement, daily comfort from the Holy Spirit. He's the one doing it. Daily illumination, turning on the lights as you read a text and suddenly it's like you never read this text before because you're seeing things you've never seen before. 
That's a gift to all believers. Downstream of Pentecost, every believer gets that. It's available for everyone who's in, in Christ. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, later to the Roman believers, he will say this, you are in the Spirit, and he goes on to say this, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So to lack the Spirit isn't just to lack power or anointing in your life. Paul says to lack the Spirit is to be outside of Christ. That's how sure this is that it belongs to you. You belong to Christ, you get it. You get fire, you get leading, you get comfort, you get the presence of God. This side of Pentecost, there's only one kind of Christian, a Spirit-filled Christian. A Spirit-filled Christian. So the Spirit of God manifests the presence of God. The, the takeaway for the church today isn't for us to try to recreate uh, and reenact element for element what happens in, on the day of Pentecost. Th- those efforts, I would say, are misguided. Those efforts, they're misguided because they miss the uniqueness of the event of the unrepeatable outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost on the church. In other words, we're not trying to recreate everything that happened there with wind and fire, right? We, should we feel bad because we haven't had a wind event at the Church of Brook Hills inside here? I haven't seen tongues of fire show up on top of people's heads. Should that make us feel like we're on the outside or we're second-tier Christians? No, not by, by no means. Because you keep reading through the New Testament, and when the Spirit shows up, He doesn't just do wind and fire stuff. He does all kinds of other things. So you keep reading the New Testament, you come to the book of Ephesians. And the Apostle Paul says, Keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens when gathered believers are filled with the Spirit? Is it wind and fire? No. Is it speaking in tongues? No. You know what happens? They're filled with the Spirit and they start singing. It it fills their praise toward God with passion and vibrancy. It affects the singing of the gathered church. Here's Paul's words, Ephesians 5, 18. Be filled, it means continually be Keep being filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms. Here's the overflow of the Spirit's filling. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this, what happens in Ephesians chapter five is the Spirit comes and the people sing. The Spirit comes and infuses joy and vibrancy into the worship of the people of God. Friend, understand, ever since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has delighted to produce in the church a powerful sense that God is here. That God is here when we gather Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul would write to the church at Corinth and he says, if we do this right and we lean into the Lord and we're desirous of him, even unbelievers will walk away from the gathering saying, truly God was among those people. There was a set, God was doing something in those people. He was pouring hope into those people. I'm not even sure I believe it yet, but I could see the effect on these people as I joined them. So the question isn't, when's the last time we as a church heard wind or saw fire? The better question is, are you hungry to see God move in power in your life and in the world? That's the better question. The better question is, are you seeking his presence daily? Seeking his power daily? So the Holy Spirit is sovereign. The Holy Spirit manifests the presence of God. And third, the Holy Spirit creates a people of God-centered praise. Holy Spirit creates a people of God-centered praise. Look down in verse four. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues. That's a word that means languages. We'll come back to that. In different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language and skip down and then it says we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues so again the word for tongues here is the word for language so God enabled this is what the miracle of what happened on the day of Pentecost spirit comes down swoops through the room 
tongues of fire over every head and enables them to speak languages they've never studied, never taken a class, right? Um, and suddenly they're speaking Parthian, fluent Parthian. <laughs> and they're spilling out into the streets, declaring the greatness of God in languages they've never heard and never learned in 15 nations language. And it's interesting that there happen to be 15 nations <laughs> listening. So it is an awesome event. So we're gonna come back to why God enabled them to speak in other languages in a minute. But for the moment, pay attention to what they're saying in those languages. That, that's where the action is. So verse 11, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. At its root, Pentecost was an overwhelming experience of the greatness of God. An overwhelming experience of the greatness of God. And I borrow that phrase from John Piper, who when he preached this text, I, I love this statement that he made, so I just pulled it in. That's the essence of the fullness or the baptism in 1 verse 4 and 5 that they received. An overwhelming experience of the greatness of God and a spilling over in courageous, passionate praise and witness. I don't say the miracle of speaking in other languages is at the heart of the experience because the spirit fell on the church again in Acts 4.31 and the house was shaken and the fullness came and passion and boldness was there but there were no new tongues nor were there wind and fire. In other words, God seems to give whatever manifestations he pleases at different times. They are not the essence. So here's, here's a point for us to take away and ponder. The rhythm of faith throughout God's word basically goes like this. God's rescuing power elicits unceasing worship. You see, mighty deeds of God responded to by praise that befits his great work. Time and time again, God rescues his people and the people worship. Moses, what happens in the Exodus? Moses brings the people through the Red Sea and what happens on the other side of the Red Sea? They're literally on the far shore of the Red Sea and out come the tambourines and the people sing. The very first hymn that's recorded in your Bible is on the far side of the Red Sea. Egyptian armies bobbing in the background in the sea and the people sing, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and rider thrown into the sea. He has saved us. We are safe, we are secure, we are his. It's time to sing, it's time to praise. They break out in song. But th this God word worship, because that's what's going on, it's doxology first, not witness yet. We'll get to witness in a moment. But first, it's doxology. They're declaring the mighty acts of God. It is God word praise. The, other pe the people in the nations are overhearing them. They're not directing the word at the nations. In other words, when Peter comes to preach in just a moment, he's going to need to preach because they're not preaching, they're worshiping. They're praising. But this God word worship is also connected to the proclamation of the gospel. And we can see that the two are connected by just asking the question, why tongues? So why worship God out here in the streets of Jerusalem in 15 languages? Why tongues? It's clear evidence that God's agenda moving forward is for all the nations to declare his praise. In other words, it was those early disciples' way of doing this thing and saying, first we'll do it, then you will. First, we'll sing his praise in 15 languages all over the nations of the world, and then the nations of the earth all over the world will sing his praises. This is a preview of what's to come. It pre really is a preview of the rest of the book of Acts. We'll sing first, you sing next. It's coming your way. This gospel of the kingdom, this risen king, Jesus, he's gonna dawn on you moments from now. In other words, this is an outpouring of praise for the purpose of an ingathering. It's an outpouring for the purpose of an in-gathering. Martin Lloyd-Jones' statement that I read earlier, it is so needed. I'll just read it again. I spent half my time telling people to study doctrine and the other half telling them doctrine is not enough. 
let me just sharpen the pencil and, and move from that statement to another statement, and it's this one. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit, soundly articulated, doesn't give you power to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit gives you power to live the Christian life. You hear the difference? The doctrine of the Holy Spirit by itself does not move the needle, does not empower you to live the Christian life. It's the third person of the Trinity empowering you, indwelling you, filling you. That's where the power comes from, from God himself. You engaging with God, he gives you power to live the Christian life. I wanna leave you with two brief words in the Sobrook Hills section. So the first is a word about freshness in your walk. So let me just encourage you, seek freshness in your walk with the Lord. And I, I can't help but think that in a room this size, some of you are stagnant in your Christian life. And, and maybe it's for a lack of consistent time in God's word where he breathes life into us through his word. Maybe it's for a lack of consistency in prayer. Maybe it's for a lack of consistency in gathering with believers in gathered worship on Sunday mornings. But let me ask you this, this question. When's the last time you ask the Lord to fire up your affection for God. When's the last time you ask the Lord to work powerfully in your life, to work powerfully in your struggle against sin, to work powerfully in your battle with fear or anxiety, to work in your life? My, my brother and I, my older brother, Paul, uh, we share prayer requests, and we've been praying about some, a couple of things in our life and larger family, and uh, we saw a breakthrough this week. And we, we've been asking for that breakthrough for a long time and, and it was as though we've been trying to ask for it as if the Holy Spirit might just walk up and do something. Right? Might just walk up and just say, okay, I'm gonna start changing this thing. When's the last time you and your small group began by saying, Lord, before we study, we're asking you to come. Holy Spirit, Make truth click tonight. Don't, don't make this just status quo another night. Don't just send us home with notes and principles. Heal somebody tonight. Lift heavy burdens tonight. Do that thing you do, you've been doing for 2,000 years. Do it again, but do it here among us. Move in power again. And then secondly, a word about drifting in our denominational ditches. So again, I grew up charismatic all all my family members are church planters who planted charismatic churches. I know, I know charismatic church culture like I speak English as my first language. Uh, so let me just say it this way. If you have concerns about the charismatic movement, I have more. <laughs> uh, and I, have, I just say it that way because I, I, know, I know where the ditches are. I, I know, I have stories of where that can go wrong. Many stories of how that can go wrong. Having said that, hard pivot. So I've got 25 years, first 25 years of my life in charismatic church, and then I'm running up 22 years in more reformed and Baptist settings. And here's my observation for what it's worth. Both cars can drive into the ditch. They can drive into, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. And you can drive into the ditch on this side or you can drive into the ditch on that. And no ditch is better than the other ditch. It's a ditch. It's not the road. You don't want to be there, right? Both sides can drive into the ditch. Charismatics, my charismatic friends, can seek an experience that drifts toward emotionalism. Reformed friends, Baptist friends, can sometimes not hunger for God's presence at all. Not seek an experience at all. Matter of fact, could even manifest a suspicion of experience and experiencing the presence of God. Most of the sermons, I'll just say this anecdotally for what it's worth, most of the sermons I listened to this week on Acts chapter two were preached by Baptist and Reformed people. And nearly all of those Baptist and Reformed people emphasized that the day of Pentecost is unrepeatable. It's a transition in history. You can't redo it. It happened 2,000 years ago and it changed everything. Nearly all of them said that much. And then one of them said, yes, plus more. And that other Baptist was a guy named John Piper. <laughs> and John Piper said this. This isn't a direct quote, but this is the essence of the message. Yes, 
the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost was unrepeatable in very important ways, but you better not lock the Spirit outside. You better not confine his greatest works to ancient history. And I, I so resonate with that. Brooke Hills, the Spirit of God is alive and at work today. The day of Pentecost serves notice to the church of every age that the Spirit is out here and available. And if you don't lean in, you'll be the poorer for it. And if you don't seek his power, you will be weaker. And if you don't pray for the Spirit to reap a harvest among the nations, then the soil of the nations will remain rock hard. But the Spirit breathes life. Still does. He has loved breathing life for 2,000 years. The Spirit breaks fallow ground in the world, breaks fallow ground in your life, breaks fallow ground in your family. Is that what you want? Then ask him. Ask him as if you trust that at some point, maybe not five minutes from now, but maybe after you persevere, maybe the Holy Spirit will walk in and say, that thing you've asked me to do, I'm doing it, and I'm doing it now. 